You are listening to a Sunday morning message from River Corner Church. River Corner Church is a growing church community of everyday people who gather to worship God, follow Jesus, and journey through life together. You are invited to gather with us on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. If you have any questions about something you heard in this message, or if you want to learn more about our growing church community, visit us online at rivercornerchurch.com. So we're continuing our series on the Lord's Prayer. Um, this stanza we're, we're focused on today is, uh, and, and lead us not into temptation. So it's a lot about God's guidance. But I'm going to turn to Matthew 6, 5 through 13. We're going to look at the context around the Lord's Prayer. That's going to help us shed some light on this particular stanza and as we uh, go along this morning with this. So I'm going to read uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 through 13. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room and close the door and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you even ask him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So the context of the Lord's Prayer shows us that Jesus is trying, one of his main goals here is to reveal God's heart to us, and to help us understand who God is through the prayer. Because uh, in verse 5 and, and so forth, Jesus has presented that the Pharisees have a view of who God is, and the pagans do too. Both groups are kind of approaching God from different, different uh, sides of the spectrum, so to speak. The Pharisees are like, I've got to do all these religious rituals and things and make God happy and, and get God's attention. I've got to wear extra big religious clothing. At the time, they had, extra, these, they had these prayer boxes they wrap on their heads, and theirs were extra big. Uh, they're called phylacteries, and they have extra long uh, tassels at the end of their prayer shawls. And the Pharisees would do all these things that get God's attention. They get God's approval through working for it and striving for it, so to speak. On the other spectrum, you had pagans who would just babble on and on all these words and phrases and try to use magic to get God to do what they want, or the gods or whatever they were thinking. So Jesus is saying, okay, those are those other ways that the people seek me, but push all that aside and focus on the Father in heaven who loves you. And, and we've been going through the different stanzas, but in this particular one, it's about his leadership and his guidance in our lives. And we can see through this verse that Jesus is teaching us that how we see or perceive God directly influences, influences our relationship with him. If we are afraid of him, it is hard to be led by him. Or if we are like our culture and believe that life has no ultimate meaning, we will believe that there is no journey to go on to begin with. So... This stanza, lead us not into temptations, already giving us a sense that there's a purpose to our lives. We're being led somewhere to a destination, and it's a good place to be, and we can trust our Father. Now, our culture around us doesn't really believe that. They're like, well, life's kind of meaningless and pointless, and then you're just going to die one day. Good luck. You know, that's sort of like how our culture is. But the way of Jesus is not like this. It's, we're connected to a good Father who cares for our needs. And we, by all, and we are all by nature afraid of the unknown. So this stands in the Lord's Prayer reminds us who God truly is and releases us from that fear of the unknown. Because all of us wrestle with that. Like, God, what's going, what's my, what's, what am I going to face tomorrow? What am I going to face two months from now? What am I going to face in ten years? All of us wrestle with this stuff. It's human to do that. But Jesus is saying, lead us on to temptation. God's leadership is with us, guiding us, uh, correcting us watching over us and shepherding us. And that's one of the keys to this, is seeing God as a shepherd. Because his, his leadership and guidance is very much like a shepherd to a sheep. And people get offended when we're compared to sheep. Like, I have relatives that are missionaries in Mexico, and if you ever talk about people being like sheep, people get really offended. Because, you know, we have sheep right outside here, you can see that they're not very smart. You know, like every time they blink, they think it's another day or something. You know, they're just, they're, that's what they are, they're sheep, you know. Uh, and it's not to insult us, but 
we're finite beings, we don't know everything, we have a limited perspective on life, and God is infinite, and God is all-knowing. And he knows vastly more than we could ever possibly know, so it isn't insulting, it's just, it's just a, it's a frame to help us see things, that you know, we need guidance, we need leadership, we need someone with a vision to help us, to tell us who we are. Uh, so it isn't so much God offending us by comparing us to sheep, it's just that we are very much in need of a shepherd. Someone who knows what, what's going on, the, the things we cannot see, and, and leading us towards a destination. The Bible's full of imagery of God as the shepherd of Israel. Um, and I think God has always used Israel being a desert nomadic people to really teach us who he is. He's, he calls them out of wandering in, in, in this wilderness to come into a place where he can be with them in an in a, in actual uh, in a country. And people there know that by instinct that you know, the desert's hard, it's harsh. It, it's the same kind of parallel for us. Life can be hard, it can be harsh. It's a journey somewhere. And there's going to be desert moments, there's going to be a lack of things, there's going to be all these things, all these, these factors that can make life difficult and challenging. But, it, but he's still the good shepherd who leads us through all these challenges and takes us to where we need to go. So the most implicit scripture that highlights God as a shepherd is Psalm 23. And I think Psalm 23 in this stanza of lead us not into temptation, they kind of dovetail. So I'm going to look at Psalm 23. And I'm going to read this here. Because this helps us identify God as being our shepherd and leading us. So Psalm 23. We usually sing, the, we usually uh, recite this at funerals, which I think is a misappropriation of this. This is a psalm about life, by the way. It's not so much a psalm about death. I mean, it's comforting when we're, when we're grieving but this is a psalm about life, because he's, he's leading us. So, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So there's a correlation between lead me not into temptation and Psalm 23. There's a sense that God is our shepherd leading us and guiding us. And Psalm 23 doesn't hide that though God is leading us, he leads us sometimes through hard things. And just as the Lord's prayer is asking the Father, uh, is asking the Father for things. We're, we're asking, in a sense, not to be tempted to believe that the Father is out to harm us. And I think we have to remind ourselves in the Lord's Prayer and in Psalm 23, when they're connected together, that God's leadership sometimes can be scary. It can be something that we don't understand completely. But he's never abandoned us. He's always with us. And it's his guidance and his peace and his comfort that helps us get through really hard things sometimes. Because there's no guarantee in life that we're not going to go through those things. If anything, we're guaranteed we will go through hard things. Because that's life. We live in a broken world with broken people doing broken things. And so that's how things go. So, the, so one of the things we wrestle with as people, as believers in Jesus, is sometimes his leadership. It's like, how can I not be offended at your leadership? When you lead me through those dark valleys, am I going to get offended? Am I going to want to walk away? Because there is that temptation to do that. Because... As he's guiding us through these dark seasons, these nights, so to speak, of the soul, sometimes we can't even sense that he's there, but he is. And when we come out to the other side of those things, we'll be, sometimes we're a lot more aware of God's presence. But when we're in the valley, he is with us. And it's that comfort uh, that makes it, that's our rock that we can stand on through those things. So when we're praying the Lord's Prayer, we're praying, Father, lead us not into temptation. It's, this is all underneath all of that, undergirding it as a structure. Like, Father, I, I'm going through these things, but Lord, be with me. Help me to, to, to be with you, and even when I'm being tempted, help me to understand that you're with me, that you're guiding me, and you have a plan for me. Psalm 23's destination is the house of the Lord, and, that, and that's the unending presence of God. So this is the same destination that Jesus is, is intimating in the Lord's Prayer. So Jesus has, in the Lord's Prayer, uh, the whole thing is about honoring God, Knowing God, God take care, taking care of our daily needs, leading us and guiding us. And at the end, the whole point of this is, is to be with him where he is forever. So that we have a destination with him. And the Lord's Prayer helps ground us in God's reality. 
that he's calling us, that he's, he's fashioning us in his image, and he has a plan for us, that he's leading us and guiding us somewhere. This makes sense. So there's a destination to the journey. The, the, the fundamental thing about the scriptures is that there's a plan for our lives, there's a purpose to our lives. It means something because Jesus died for us and is redeeming us. We're not just left out to figure it out for ourselves. He's leading us and guiding us somewhere. So the destination is him, is closeness to him, even through the hard things. It's drawing nearer to him in times of, of difficulty. It's not nihilism thinking that I'm abandoned and, and I might as well just drift out all alone here. That's not how this works. So the Spirit is leading us in the pilgrimage that we call life to the house of the Lord. And temptations are always going to be those things that, that take us off the road we're on. We're following Christ He's our shepherd. He's leading us down the road. And there's all these things on the side that are trying to get us to, hey, let's go off over here. So in a lot of ways, temptations to leave the journey with the shepherd, we can either eat the good food or the cheap food. So it's kind of like this. So say that we're at our father's house and, and our father, let's imagine our father's a really good cook. You know, my dad is, and my dad just made grilled cheese when we were hungry. He, was, he wasn't a really good cook. But let's imagine for a second that our father is the best cook in the world. He's making everything from scratch. You know, he's got organic eggs he's making something with. He's got organic rice. He's got, you know, grass-fed lamb or beef or whatever you want. All this stuff. He's a good cook. But he's like, okay, I'm going to make all this food, but you, it's going to take about an hour or two. You're going to have to be okay with waiting. You know, here's like a cracker or something to tide you over, you know. But next door, two, two blocks down, there's, there's this, like, goofy, terrible fast food restaurant. Okay, we'll, we'll call it Clown Burger because I don't want to get sued by McDonald's if they're listening to this... So we'll call it Clown Burger, okay? So Clown Burger is making, you know, greasy fast food, fries that are terrible for your heart, all this stuff, but everything's like a dollar. So they're, they're over there at Clown Burger making the food, and, you know, we're waiting for the father to make us the meal, and it's like, yeah, I got to wait an hour, but Clown Burger's over there, you know? Like, I could just go right over there and get me, a, like, a fry for a dollar, you know? Even though this, I'm going to feel terrible after I eat this, this, this it'll satisfy the itch I'm feeling right now. So I'm, I'm waiting, I'm waiting for God to, to make this food for me, so to speak. His ways, his goodness, all the things he gives us when we follow. But Clown Burger's over here, and, and, and the temptation is to, is to jump over there and grab it. But there's this internal struggle and, and, and impulse in me that wants to go the cheap and easy route to get the quick fix. And I'm trying to deny that and realize that God is, has this good thing for me. That's how kind of have temptation works. So when we're praying, Father, lead me not to temptation. It's like, God, help me not to go to Clown Burger for this fix. Help me to, to stay with you and, and, and eat the food you have for me because it's good for me. So leading us into temptation, lead, sorry, leading us not into temptation, we're asking God to help us overcome the impulse. And T. Wright elaborates on this in one of his books. So he, when he, he breaks apart the phrase, lead us not into temptation, we kind of can see it three different ways. So he says, to say, lead us not into temptation does not, of course, mean that God himself causes people to be tempted. It has rather three levels of meaning. First, it means let us escape the great tribulation, the great testing that is coming on all the world. And that may be either eschatology or maybe about something in the first century. Second, it means do not let us be led into temptation that we, that we will be unable to bear it. And he says, compare that with 1 Corinthians 10, 12-13. Finally, it means enable us to pass safely through the testing of our faith. So this has a, a deep meaning to it. God, help me to endure, help me to, to move on, and help me to follow you through hard things. Let me not be tempted to grab the cheap fix. Help me to stay on the course with you, is essentially what it's saying. Because God alone is perfect love, and that love sustains us throughout all difficulties or temptations we face to choose another path. So... A lot of temptation is, you know, James talks about this too, James 1 through 13. Actually, I'll read that because that's really illuminative on this, like what temptation actually is. Because we kind of think it's always external, and it is an external thing as well, but it's also an internal thing. Because uh, by our natures, we are broken, and we prefer clown burger over a good uh, handmade meal that's going to take a while. So James chapter 1 through 13, uh, verse 13 rather. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. 
So there is this internal thing in us that wants the cheap, easy, quick thing, and that's always sin. Uh, it's easy to get those things if we're looking for them, but God's ways always challenge us to grow beyond what we've relied on in the past for our sustenance. Whereas before we may have went to Clown Burger every day to get our quick fix, to get those things that make us feel good, look good, and have the advantage over somebody else. That's what sin essentially is. Jesus is challenging us, trust me for your provision. Trust me for the good food. You don't have to go next door to Clown Burger anymore. But the inner temptation in us is always like, oh, it's just right there. It's just two houses away. You know, it, it's, it's a dollar. You know, I like deals. You know, it's, it's, it's so easy to go over there. And we do have an external foe, too, that's, you know, one day we'll look at our mailbox and there's like a 50% off coupon for Clown Burger. And we're like, well, how did that happen? You know, because it's, you know, the enemy's dangling the coupon. Like, hey, you know, I'll, I'll give you half off if you come over to Clown Burger today. You know, I'll, I'll give you the fries for 75% off, whatever, just come in. You know, that's his tactic. But it's, it's to get us to eat the bad food, the cheap stuff, and, and push away the good things God has for us. So we have to see sin and temptation more like this. We often see it as breaking a rule. And yeah, there's rules to help us know when, when we're sick and what sin is. Like, we don't know, you know we, if, if we have the flu unless we go to a doctor and we get, get an exam. It's the same thing with the law and how the law teaches us about sin. Like, we can, di- we can be diagnosed that we're uh, doing this and that by the, the sinless in the Bible, but there's something in our hearts that's in- intrinsically wrong and it needs to be fixed and changed and, and adapted, and that's through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we know that we're, we're craving and we're hungry for something, and we, but we have to, to put that in the right position and in, in the right outlet, and that's always the Father and what the Father has for us. Um, when we take the other way, we harm ourselves. So when we go to Clown Burger, we're just getting sick and hurting ourselves. We need to see reality and address it for what it is. Fulton Sheen has a really good quote that I like. Uh, he says, every person is stronger for knowing the worst they can about themselves than acting on that knowledge. And I think that's really challenging, but it's really true. I don't know that I have an addiction to Clown Burger unless I step outside of myself and realize, oh, I have a really bad habit here. I'm going over to this place to find this, this, this fix that isn't really working for me. It's making me sick. I don't realize it's making me sick, but you know, I've gained you know, 100 pounds, I, you know, I, I, I'm out of breath when I go upstairs. You know, I'm, I'm sweating all the time. It's like I'm really sick and gross from eating clown burger all the time. Something's wrong with me. But it, it takes that stepping outside of yourself and the Holy Spirit kind of convicting us. That's what conviction does. It's like, hey, wait a second. You're, getting, you're sick from eating this stuff. Like, I have good food right here. If, if you follow me, if you let me be your shepherd and let me lead you past this temptation to eat over here, I actually will give you life. Like, I have a good meal for you that actually will make you healthy. It won't make you sick. And there won't be some, some, you know, like, they don't change the grease of Clown Burger for, like, six months. You know, it's not good for you. You know, that's what, that's what, clown, <laughs> that's what clown Burger is, you know. But in the, in the Father's house, there's always good food. There's always the correct way to live because it's how we're meant to live. Our bodies are meant to eat good things. They're not meant to eat bad things. So the kingdom of God is God's reality. It's heaven coming to earth through the power of the Spirit and showing us uh, his ways of life. And we need the Father's guidance to see this reality. And his leading will reveal reality to us. So we're praying, Father, lead me not into temptation. It's like, God, show me what is real. Show me what is true. Show me what I actually need. Because I'm used to living life on my own terms and it's not really working out for me. Like, I need you. And in a lot of ways, we... We hold on to these little idols. Sometimes they've, they've been things we've had since we were young, like defense mechanisms, you know, patterns of behavior, like just thought patterns we've had forever that we hold on to. And we're like, you know, I need this little thing to make myself get through the day or get through my life. And I know that it isn't God. And God's telling me gently, like, son, let that thing go because it, you're not going to find life in this thing. This thing's always been, it's always been a way of death. And the older I get, and the, no, I think the older I am and I walk with God, I, God deals with the deeper things in me. Like, you know, there's all the surface things we've been dealing with forever. Like, yeah, don't swear, don't smoke, don't chew, blah, blah, blah. There's all the surface stuff. Then there's the deeper stuff underneath all that. Like, God, I have, I have th- this issue in my heart where I'm insecure about this, or I'm, I'm relying on this. 
I'm not relying on you. You know, you're not being my, my all and all. It's like I've had this little thing I've carried with me since I was 15 or, or 10 or, or 2 or whatever it was, trying to get through life with. And God's like, just let that stuff go. You know, we don't have to serve the passions that are all around us. Our culture is hypercharged by materialism and greed and, and lust and death and, and all sorts of stuff. And that's not our diet anymore. We're called out to be the separate people who are full of the, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. And none of that we can do in ourselves. It's countercultural and it's counter nature to us. It's a supernatural thing. It takes the Holy Spirit to do this in us. But we're partnering with him. And the Lord's Prayer is a great way to center down in the reality of God. Realizing that, okay, God, is, is, God has an order to life. He has a way of life. I want to bring his order into my life. Like, Father, come into this broken shell of who I am and fill me with you. That's the Lord's Prayer, is putting our feet into God's reality. So it's not just meant to be just a rote thing we say to make us feel religious. It's meant to ground us, anchor us in the reality of God. And God is in us. So lead us not into temptation, is grounding us in the reality that God is our shepherd, and we shall not want. And he gives us everything we need. And so that's what this is about, I believe. And we need that reality. And a part of accepting that reality is letting go of the things we don't need. So John Michael Talbot, he's a, a singer, and he's a, a monk, and some other stuff. He is a, he's, a, he's a lot of things, I guess. But he... Uh, he says in this, in this book I kind of found recently, and I started cracking it open. It's called The Fire of God. It's really good. But he's saying this about sin and, and about the things we hold on to and, uh, and about God. He says, I must either let go of sin or let go of God. I cannot possess them both. It is far better that in all cases God remakes me according to his image after the pattern of the image of his son. And so all of us are in this type of place. And all of us are, are growing and being uh, shaped and formed by God. And we're in all, we're, all of us aren't there yet. You know, there's no pressure to be something we're not. God is a good father who gives us good food to eat. If we keep eating that food, we're going to grow and we're going to get healthy and strong. If we agree with him and we push away clown burgers, advertisements, and coupons, and, and when they blow the fan the, over the, the grease to get, you know, to get it go over to our house and make us smell it and want to like, you know, swim over there like an old cartoon or something, that's, what, that's what's happening. And the Spirit gives us the power to say no uh, to, the, to the old ways and say yes to the ways of life. And that's a process. And we're all in that process, and we're all on that journey, and all of us are broken so there's no comparison or no need to drum up some kind of thing or compare ourselves to others and where they're at. We don't have to do that. God has given us the grace to change. We have to just accept that and receive that. So it isn't about performing. It's about being a son and being a daughter, letting him lead us away from temptation. Uh, we often hold on to things that make us feel good and be in control. And these are those little idols that I was talking about earlier. They don't lead us to the path of life. Temptation always involves being tempted to use these idols, to always pick them up, to always use them to be our identity, uh, to, to try to uh, make us feel better than what that, that void that we feel in our, in our hearts. All of us wrestle with you know, not being exactly what we want to be, uh, so we, we have these little things that try to make us feel better about ourselves. And we can let those things go, because God is our Father, you know, that's our identity now. It's, it's no longer being these, these people trying to figure it out, trying to, to make our way in the world. Like God's a good father now who has, has adopted us into his family. So everything shifts and changes now. So we have the Holy Spirit present with us. And God's guidance involves drawing us closer to himself and weaning us off these things. One of the things that John Michael Talbot was saying uh, is that God's presence is the shelter when the temptations do come. And I think that the Lord's Prayer is a beautiful way to shelter in God. So when we need to be reminded who we are, you know, when these little idols are calling out, well, you're this, you know, and a lot of times they're not even good things, like, you're a failure, you know, like the little idols will speak to us, like, you're a failure, you're terrible, you're this, you're that, you're all these things. 
but we have to remind ourselves who God is. So when the, the Lord's Prayer is that thing to ground us again in, in the reality of who God is, get our feet down again into the soil of who he is. And it, it reminds us that you're a good father, you're my father in heaven, and I'm connected to you now. Hallowed be your name. You know, he doesn't leave us because we struggle. He's present with us in our struggles. He doesn't lead us when we're being, he doesn't leave us when we're being tempted. He leads us through it. He leads us beyond it, and he leads us to, some, to a place in him that's deeper than where we were before. So that's what he does. And his prayer, the Lord's Prayer will always bring us back to the reality of who God is. So if we're struggling, if we're, if, if we're realizing that God's sifting things out of us and, and, and sifting our hearts, going through our hearts and dealing with things, that's okay. We're all in that process to some degree. I know right now I'm in that process. Like God's shaking stuff out of me. Like, hey, you don't, you don't need this stuff anymore. Like I have the good food for you. you know? I, can, I can sense that I'm in that season with him. And he isn't mad at me. He wants to set me free and help me. So that's what he does. So as a, as a final point, Jesus gives us the Lord's Prayer to help ground us in the reality of the kingdom of God. His guidance and shepherding is the heart of this prayer. So in addition to praying the Lord's Prayer, pray Psalm 23 too, is, is kind of an addition to that. Because it, Psalm 23 t- tells us of the nature of God. And the Lord's Prayer shows us how to apply that nature into our life.